So David Spector, welcome. Well, great to be here. Uh, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been an interesting last couple weeks. Uh, this news was Friday. Uh, and we were on the Today Show, we were on the Nightly News, we've been in everywhere. Uh, and it's pretty interesting, uh, speaking of tech ventures and scaling tech ventures, uh, we started this company in our living room seven years ago. And we told investors at the time, I in particular, uh, you have to think big, you have big, you have to sell a dream when you're raising capital and you're trying to build something. Uh, people would say, well, where do you see yourselves in 10 years? Where is this business going to be? Uh, and, and I would say with a lot of confidence that uh, we are going to put Victoria's Secret out of business. And we are going to at some point buy their smoldering assets in bankruptcy. Uh, and we also said, I think at the time we had a, uh, our daughter was one, she's six and a half now. Uh, we said we have a, a young daughter and hopefully by the time she's old enough to be buying a bra, 12, 11, 12, 13, she won't be negatively influenced by Victoria's Secret. And we will do our part to stop that and put a positive force out into the world that does a better job of representing real women and supporting real women and building something that our own daughter can be proud of and can look up to. And so here we are a lot faster than we expected uh, and this happens. And we were asked by a number of people, including our own team, where would Victoria's Secret be today without Third Love? And that's really the interesting thing. Many of their problems are not related to us. Uh, what we did and what we set out to do was just to be different. And we put our head down and just executed. And we wanted nothing to do with them. We actually never even mentioned their name uh, ever. And we try not to as well because we're just different. We're building something different and good for them for building what they have going on. Um, and there's clearly today, we're converging because we're mentioned uh, constantly in relationship to them. So we have to talk about it. Uh, but what we set out to build was just fundamentally different. Uh, and at the time, investors thought we were crazy. Uh, and everybody passed, you know, most people passed on us and said, you'll never do that. No way, good luck, Heidi and Dave. You know, go pound sand, get out of here. Uh, we're passing. Uh, and so it is interesting and it, 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 it pinch us in some ways that this has occurred now. Uh, many, many years later. Uh, and so we're very proud of that uh, and excited about where we're headed as a company uh, and how open the market is becoming for us. So. so David, talk to us about this choice, direct versus TPP. So we spoke, I spoke in the last class about this and there was really this ledge that I had to be walked to and there's many ledges that you go to with your, your co-founder, your business partner, that one person is opposed to. None of these decisions are binary. None of them are obvious. Um, both sides are good. Keep TBB, go direct. They're all decisions that would have potentially could have worked out fine. Stay in Mexico, do made on, stay with Made on Demand, shift to Asia, stick with the app, go away from the app to FitFinder, uh, uh, build our own platform, switch to Shopify. All of these decisions were really hard ones and we're faced with many of them today. Fortunately, we have more capital, we're a larger business and we can bounce back if we make bad, uh, bad decisions. And when you're young, in some cases, uh, if you make a bad decision, you're done. Um, and, and this is one of those decisions, especially when we were younger, that my co-founder had to hold my hand because uh, I was really into TBB. I still actually kind of am. Uh, and she said, this is gonna be okay. This is the right decision for the business. Um, and today, for those of you that don't know and haven't been to our site, we do not offer TBB at all. That is a change from the case, because when we uh, first came here last year to present the case, we were still offering it in a very limited format. It was hard to find on the website, uh, and not that many people use it today. We get thousands of orders today, and at that point, we were doing it out of those thousands of orders, maybe it was 100 TBBs a day. So it was very, very small. We were sort of deprecating it, sunsetting it. Um, but today, it's gone, uh, and the business is doing great. Uh, but the reason why I liked it and still love it is it's a very, very compelling marketing message for those of you that raised their hand before. Um, and at the time of the case, uh, which is what we're talking about here, it continued to be a very compelling marketing message. People respond when the marketing message says, try this for free, right? And it's all about when you're advertising uh, in somebody else's feed, it's all about the thumb stop. 
uh, take a note on that because that's really what it's about. You're scrolling through. You don't go to Facebook to look for ads, right? You want to. You don't even want to see any ads, right? And so you're scrolling through, looking at cats and your friends' photos, uh, etc. And it's all about that thumb stop because you, of course, scroll past all of the the ads, um, and it's getting you to actually click on that. And the cats are really low because who doesn't like free? More importantly, too, which was important for this business in the early days, is this was an it's an important insight for many of the men, and I think many of the women don't really realize this in the terms of the way you shopped historically for bras. People go into this market looking for a bra with tremendous skepticism, uh, and women have been let down for so long in their life that there's no way this little unknown brand is ever going to deliver something that's better for me than what I currently have. Because I don't really like what I currently have. It does the job. It's fine. Eh, it's all right. Uh, but this unknown brand advertising me on Facebook, no freaking way. Um, so they approach it with immense skepticism. And so we had to find a way to let somebody try it. Because what we continue to do in our business, and for those of you that are customers, thank you for raising your hand earlier, um, you know that our product delivers so, so, so far uh, above and away on um, that experience that you've had before with prior, prior, prior products. Um, and so all we needed you to, to do is try it. All we need to do is, is get one on your body and you'll know that this is amazing and you'll be a customer of ours for life, right? That was the objective, that was the goal from, from the beginning. And so that free messaging provided us with extremely low CACs uh, and still would. I miss those CACs badly, uh, but for those of you on the go direct part, you're right. Because the LTV of that customer didn't end up being great. There's a certain type of customer that would respond to it. And that customer isn't you guys. Um, you guys are actually perfect targets in some ways for TBB where you are today. TBB in the TBB that we would like to see because you are people that will generate income when you leave school. Although today you're students, so you don't have much money. So you would probably respond to that free messaging really nicely. Um, and then you will become long-term customers because you will have stable, good incomes, good jobs afterwards. And so you'll be able to afford a third love bra and have high lifetime value. But most people out in the world are not like you. Um, and so at the beginning, as we were targeting on Facebook and we would use lookalike audiences when we were small, upload a list of 100,000 email addresses of current customers. And we would say to these systems, find me customers that look just like these 100,000 that have already purchased from me. And they would find people like you. Um, and it worked phenomenally well. But as we started to expand and grow our audiences and get in the wider areas of, of that audience targeting, we couldn't find the customers that would yield true lifetime customers. They would just try us for free, maybe keep it and never come back. Um, and so that was the hard part is as we grew and as we got bigger, the audience targeting that we could go after wasn't the type of customer that we would want to work with or be a part of long term. So those CACs wouldn't really yield somebody that would stay with us for a long time. And our business is all about delivering something of value to a consumer where she'll stay with us for a decade or more. Because we all know the switching costs are high here. Women stick with something that they like and that fits for a very, very long time. So, so David, so how did Heidi prevail in this argument? So, as she usually does, because she's brilliant, um, and I'm the luckiest uh, founder and husband in the world because she's, uh, she's amazing uh, and just a, such a great business partner in every way. Um, she prevailed because she's a lot smarter than me. And she realized that that trade-off might hurt growth in the short term, but will yield a longer, more stable business in the long term. Because if we spend 50, 60, et cetera dollars to acquire a customer, that's okay, right? And yes, I loved the days, and we still are in some months, where we were profitable on first order. Loved that. It was amazing, right? Because we would spend $30, you know, our, we have a high gross margin, uh, and then it would ultimately yield somebody that was profitable on first order. Incredible. Everybody wants that in a consumer business. Um, but ultimately, what we're building is recurring revenue and a lifetime relationship. And she realized that and looked past the numbers as a consumer. Uh, and she was, she was, of course, right that that was the right decision for us if we wanted to build this business where we developed a relationship directly with a woman for a very, very long time. Because it would attract the kind of consumer and customer that we want to have a relationship with. Not just something that's going to respond to a Facebook ad and buy something really quickly online. Very cool. Let's take questions. Yeah, Haley. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Um, so we've seen recently a trend of DTC businesses kind of coming back into bricks and mortar, especially since it seems like there's going to be some retail space available. Is that something you guys have considered? Yeah, so the question was about retail and what we're considering. So uh, we, uh, many other, so when we started the company, DTC wasn't even a term. Um, and so we just wanted to build a brand and build something really different. Uh, and we were, as mentioned earlier, we were from outside the industry, which hurt us and was made it so difficult to build this business at the beginning because of the complexity of building a bra. However, it ended up, because we were thinking different, and we were from outside the industry, we wanted to do things very differently. And so while we had tons of pain early on, um, and had many examples of when we almost failed, um, those experiences and what we built ultimately yielded a stronger business. But for retail, we did want to find a new way to reach customers. And we've always talked about it, but we wanted to build a nine-figure, $100 million plus business online. Because this is one of those categories, as women know, that you don't like shopping for. It's not fun. It's not an experience you do with your friends. You don't go, you know, you don't go walk around the mall and go bra shopping together. So it was an experience that should be online. We were actually surprised when we started this business that it was mostly offline and the online penetration was so low of the category. Um, but what we said was if we can build a unique retail experience in a really smart way after we were past 100 million in revenue, we might have a shot at building a unique retail experience in ways where we don't have to have 1,100 stores like our, our competitor. Um, and so that was really the thought process. And so today we actually do have a concept store in Soho. Um, it's doing really, really well. Uh, we're very proud of what we've done there. There's a lot that we're gonna change in the future. We're building more stores this year, not in a huge way, um, but in a really smart way, certain markets, small footprints, uh, relatively short-term leases. Um, to find a way to actually have retail be accretive to the overall process. We don't want it to be a majority of our revenue. We don't, we don't want it to be significant. We want it to be accretive. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the decision making for your like overall advertising budget? Because it sounds like a large percentage of your venture funding went to like Facebook ads. And my own hypothesis would be that all of that advertising is just going to like maybe convince people to go to Neiman's or Saks. To like pr purchase a bra that actually does fit for them. But how do you decide like when is enough enough? When should we let off the gas and actually just focus on our base of current customers rather than grow? So Courtney's question was about how we spend our marketing dollars, uh, and it's a very very important function of our business today. It's 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 how we uh, grow our new customer customer base, how we reach new customers, and in some cases too. Although we don't have to spend much money to, 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 to reacquire somebody, um, in some cases it's, it's useful for reminding people that they need to repurchase from us again. That's a lot less costly though. Um, and so our focus has really been about how we reach people where we can tell, best tell our story. Um, and we have a unique example um, because it really is about a story. Uh, it's about explaining to them what they currently have might not work. Did you know that 70-80% uh, of women are wearing the wrong size? Do you have these issues? Uh, it, it, you know, do you do you need your partner to scratch your back the second you take your bra off? These different kind of cute ads that we create, all video content, um, that have allowed us to tell our story. Um, and the best uh, way for us to do that uh, is through social media advertising uh, and other types of display advertising where we can tell the story better. And one of the things that we've gotten really good at is throwing lots of concepts at the wall every month and just keep in, continuing to spend on things that work stopping to spend quickly on things that aren't working, just constantly testing. And one of the things that I'll tell you, and it's been an important insight for us, is today the ability to target uh, and to bid, bidding strategy, is commoditized. You know, Power Editor is really great. Uh, Facebook makes it super easy. Google does. They want small businesses. They want MBA students to be able to test things really easily and have a fair shot against larger companies like us that have a team that do this, right? It's less about that and so much more about the content that you create. And we have the ability today, unlike the early days, TBB versus Direct, to tell that story because we have the budgets to spend more money on content. Um, in the early days, we didn't, right? So the free messaging worked really, really well. And today, we have a better ability to actually develop content and build things that speak to our consumers in a much better way. Great guess. Um, so when you talked about social media being your main channel, what emotion are you trying to evoke when you talk about like um stops? Is it about educating the consumer or is it about creating some sense of like fear or like, you know, controversy against other types of brands or like what's the appeal and how has that changed over time when you were a newer brand versus now when you do have some higher awareness in the market? And so the question was really about how we spend our dollars online um, and what type of advertising we create. 
Um, we never talk about other brands. Again, as I said earlier, it's really just about what we're doing and putting our head down and just focusing um, and, and conveying something that's different to women. Um, and so a lot of our messaging really is about education um, and explaining to consumers that what they might be wearing right now is uncomfortable. And did you know that there is a better option? And again, most people are fairly unhappy with what they have. It does the job. I don't have to think about it too much. It's fine. It's easy. I repurchase it. It's simple. But it could be better. Um, and so, and you know, one of the best examples is is uh, we have a lot of consumers that are quite old in their 80s, and, and we've gotten emails from them where they say, "I've been wearing the wrong bra size all my life, and I, and it's so uncomfortable for me." Uh, and one woman sent us a note saying, I can finally die in a comfortable bra. <laughs> I mean, that's really, that's, we had a real impact on her life. Um, that's cool. Uh, and that's the average woman. And those women have been around a lot longer, so they've had a tremendous amount of negative experiences with a bad bra. But they never knew that there was something better out there until third love came along. And that's real progress. Um, and that's what we're really proud of. Hey, David. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here.